as he made more and more observations and documented them all and studied them, he began to lay down a series of laws, and the first is the law of segregation, which we now understand better because we know about genes and we know about meiosis. But he figured out, even without that knowledge, barely a knowledge of cells, remember, that he knew the only way the math would work simply was for each parent to start with two factors for any given trait, but only donate one to their offspring. Now, we know, because of meiosis, that you could start with a set of chromosomes with different versions of the genes on them, and going through DNA replication, they would double, and then going through meiosis, they would be split apart, the homologous chromosomes would separate, and then their gametes would contain different versions of each trait. So the parent had two copies of A and two copies of B, whereas the gametes each have one copy of A and B. That's the law of segregation. Again, what's amazing is that he figured it out without any knowledge of cells, really, and certainly no knowledge of meiosis, but that's the law of segregation, that each parent starts with two, the gametes contain one, so they actually donate only one of the two copies to each of their offspring. Mendel actually figured out so much, but when he attempted to communicate it, it was vastly ignored or misunderstood or not taken seriously. For whatever reason, his presentation about all of this was vastly forgotten about and unknown until about the early 1900s when it was rediscovered and thankfully he was given credit even though three other people rediscovered or independently discovered what he had been working on so much earlier. Eventually, Punnett was working with poultry and came up with a very easy way to visualize inheritance patterns for the rest of us without lots of complex math. And so if you had two parents that you were crossing, one heterozygous and one homozygous recessive, you would take the alleles, the individual alleles of one parent and put them along one side of the square. The other parent would go along the other side of the square and you could fill in the squares moving down and across to come up with the possible offspring genotypes. So that's the possible offspring you could have. And each box represents a 25% probability, but just like flipping a coin is 50-50 heads or tails, it doesn't mean you're going to get heads and then tails. You could flip 10 times and get 8 of one and 2 of the other, but every time you flip the coin, you have a 50-50 chance. And according to this, every time you created an offspring, these two parents created an offspring, it would be a 25% chance of having that particular offspring genotype every time you had a child. So in this case, 50% heterozygous, 50% homozygous recessive. So looking at Mendel's work this way, you had the parent cross with the two pure breeding pea plants. They produced all heterozygotes. The phenotype would have been 100% yellow. The genotype, 100% heterozygous. The F1, or first filial cross, would have been a self-pollination of one of those offspring with itself, or all of those offspring were actually bred with themselves, allowed to self-pollinate. And that cross produced 25% homozygous dominant, 50% heterozygous, and 25% homozygous recessive. Now again, that's approximately 25, 50, and 25. That it's probabilities, again, not actual values. Now, he could only see the phenotype, and what he saw was that for every three yellow, there was approximately one green. And the genotype for every one homozygous Dominant, we have two heterozygous and one homozygous recessive. That's our more modern understanding of 
genetics, and inheritance. We call these crosses monohybrid crosses because they're only looking at one trait at a time. You can also look at dihybrid crosses. And he did. He did dihybrid crosses and he also looked at trihybrid crosses and tracked three traits at once. To track two traits at once, you need to consider the parents. They would be pure breeding for both traits. And so their offspring would get, in the case of the first parent, two dominant alleles. The second parent would always give a recessive allele. And so those would be the two gametes that would come together to form a heterozygous individual for two traits. And that's, again, your F1 generation. And so I want you to pause this video and try to figure out with that parent, uppercase A, lowercase A, dominant B, recessive B, what are the four possible gametes going to look like? Did you figure it out? So we've got two traits here, so each gamete's going to get two letters, and so two will get dominant A's, two will get recessive, two will get uppercase B's, two will get recessive, and so those are your four possible combinations. Another way to look at it is to have your big A, little a, big B, little b, and you could look at the little a and the little b, or the big A and the big b, the, the big A and the big B, and the little a and the little b. So you're really just working out every possible combination of these two alleles. Now, how do we make a Punnett square out of this? Well, you need all of those gametes to be lined up along the side of a square. So you're going to need a 4 by 4 square. And so there's an example of what you would use for a dihybrid cross. And so again, try to fill in, pause the video, and see if you can figure out where the gametes would go. So I would put big A, big B, big A, little B, little A, big B, little A, little B, repeat along the other side, and you are ready to fill this dihybrid crust in. Again, pause, try to fill it out without watching me complete it. All right, so hopefully you've completed it. Here is my attempt at filling it in. So eventually I just started working across the rows. It was easier to focus on what I was doing, and then I worked up and down, filling in. I like to have my capital letters always in front of my lowercase letters. I also like to group the A's together with the other A and the B together with the other B. That just makes it easier when you go through and start trying to figure out what each of these look like because we have a mess of genotypes here but we want to know the phenotype ratio and so if we start working across anywhere you see a dominant A that's yellow so start looking for those yellow P's you can mark yours like I'm marking mine whoopsie go way back and you can mark your green and then you should be able to start going through and anywhere you see an uppercase B with a yellow dot you've got a round yellow P. Now anywhere you see a yellow dot so you've got nine of the yellow smooth or round P's. Now we're looking for the yellow wrinkly P's and that would be all the rest with yellow dots but lowercase B's only and there are three of them. Looking for green peas that show the dominant round trait, there are three of those. And only one of the 16 has both recessive color and texture. And so that, the nine to three to three to one, is the classic ratio for a dihybrid cross done between two parents that are heterozygous for two traits. Remember that number combination. Know it, love it, 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. And from the dihybrid cross experiments came the law of independent assortment, which really what he was observing was that the parent phenotypes 
did not stay together in the same combinations in the offspring. They became new, novel combinations of traits like yellow wrinkly peas when there had only been green wrinkly peas before. And so he figured out that traits sorted themselves out independently of each other. That, we now know, is related to how chromosomes behave in metaphase 1. So you can look at, here is a set of um, chromosomes and traits. Here's another way they could align during metaphase, where the dominant B trait has switched places. And so during meiosis 1, when they separate, you're going to have different combinations in those two haploid cells formed. And then that means that after meiosis 2, you get a number of different results. Big A, little a, or big A, big B, little a, little b, big A, big, little b, little a, big b. It's a mouthful, but you can see it there on the screen. Four different possible combinations from multiple meiotic events, but again, these things are producing gametes all the time. And so about one-fourth of the gametes would all have these different combinations. And so that's the principle behind it, and that is what he observed in his pea plants. That's it for the content in these lessons as far as explaining things. Now I just want to show you a quick problem-solving skill. Um, to solve dihybrid cross problems a little faster if you have a simple question and you don't want to draw out the entire dihybrid cross. So if you're looking at two traits at one time, I've drawn you two Punnett squares here. And so yellow and green, so just the P color. Two heterozygous parents, there are your offspring. You know those genotypes, one-fourth homozygous dominant, one-half heterozygous, one-fourth homozygous recessive. Same thing with the smooth and wrinkled parents and plants. Same ratio, 1 to 2 to 1. So, if you take the phenotypes, you have 3 to 1 dominant to recessive for both traits. Simple heterozygous monohybrid cross pattern. Just looking now at those numbers and the different combinations from the dihybrid cross. You could get yellow and smooth peas, yellow and wrinkly peas, green and smooth peas, green and wrinkly peas. Now start to match up each of those traits with their phenotype ratios. So 3 fourths yellow, 3 fourths smooth, you get 9 sixteenths both. 3 fourths yellow, 1 fourth wrinkled, you get 3 out of 16 yellow and wrinkled. Same with green and smooth and green and wrinkled it's going to be a fourth times one fourth very rare and one out of sixteen and so you've probably already noticed it but just to make it super obvious you have nine to three to three to one. So if you just had a unique problem you could work out the individual monohybrid crosses for each of the traits and use multiplication to solve how many out of 16 would be your probable offspring phenotypic ratio.